chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following interactive performance is a first round entry in Chilling Tales for Dark Nights' fourth annual Evil Idol voice acting competition. And you, listener, get to help decide who advances to round two. Voting is simple. Following the performance, simply click the thumbs up icon on this video if you'd like this contestant to move forward or the thumbs down if you'd like to see them be eliminated. Voting on this entry will conclude one week after the date of its posting. Thank you, and good luck to all of our contestants. Morning, 9-19, September 25th, 1858. I happily lived these few months in ignorant bliss, unbeknownst of the horrors that were soon to come for me. Well, the blindfold is off, and what a fool I had been. Oh, how I've always known, but didn't want to believe. Something just didn't sit right. But never could I have thought that a snake or scorpion could be so charming. The teeth, the guest, the mate, the eerie feeling. His hunt of me. Why did I ignore it all? Last night... I was getting ready for bed when he tried to initiate intimacy from me. I told him I wasn't in the mood, yet he continued. So I insisted he stopped, and that I wasn't playing a game. He then became rough as to tell me that he was well aware that I wasn't fooling around, and neither was he. He grabbed me by my hair, and with a sharp pull sent me flying onto my back climbing on top of me and wrapping his hands around my throat. He was strangling me as though meaning to kill me, so I clawed and kicked and slapped as anyone else would in such a situation. But it felt as though the more I struggled, the harder his grip would become. I looked at his face, and he was just so calm. The smile pasted across it, but a very expected one like you would have when you're sassing someone if they said something rather foolish. His asphyxiation came to a stop, though he kept one hand on my neck and used the other to tear at the clothes around my breast. He began to pull at my nipples and used his nails. Oh, little Lottie, he began, never understanding that most people do not care whatever it is you want. Always so self-centered and above all others in your mind. Did you truly think you were above me too? <laughs> At the end of the day, my little Lottie, you're just another spoiled girl. I continued on trying to fight him, but he was far more powerful than I was and had such a long body I could hardly reach him somehow. He picked me up from the bed and threw me at the wall. He actually threw me like I was just some rag doll and he an impetuous child. I screamed and cried out hoping a maid or butler would hear me, but he continued his way toward me and roughly grabbed me by my jaw. <laughs> Who do you think will come to help you? The only other people here have their paychecks signed by me or simply glad that they aren't the ones in here right now. I bit him and tried to kick him away, but he only got more forceful, more powerful. It was like he was fueled off my actions. He slapped me, stepped on me, kicked me around. He was even very fond of biting and occasional strangulation. At one point, during the midst of things, he turned to me with a gnarly grin and asked, What's the matter, mine hostess? Did someone hurt you? <laughs> Following it up with a soft chuckle. I didn't know what was happening at first. I simply thought he was angry with me for my denial. But this wasn't anger he was showing me. He was trying to show me who was in charge. Who had the power. This was a game to him and he enjoyed watching me in pain more than he enjoyed shoving his cock into me. 
The fact that he hadn't even raped me of my quim or unsheathed his prick told me this had nothing to do with my denial. Had this always been what he truly wanted from me? Did he build up this illusion of a paradise and a happy future just so he could so violently tear it away from me? I wasn't about ready to stick around and continue to be his violent plaything. I may have been his wife, but I'd be damned if I continued to be. I'm writing to my family. They will help me. They must. Noon, 12.32, September 27th, 1858. My husband hasn't hurt me since the other night. But he certainly isn't acting like it never happened. In fact, he brings it up occasionally, almost like it's a joke or my fault, something that I did. In his words is implication that it will indeed happen again. I feel like he's waiting for me to fully heal before trying once more, but for what reason, I have no idea. The maids keep staring at me with a pitiful and pale look on their face. The swinish whores always knew, didn't they? He implied it. That they were grateful it wasn't them. That they were grateful it was me this time. I had become the replacement for his games and amusements. They were waiting and hoping for this day to finally come, where I take their place. Well, now I hope they feel the shame of their wishes, the little chits. I wrote my letter and have sent it off of the butler. I believe his name is Terrell, and I have no idea if the man even knows how to speak English. He's a German brute, just like my husband, and he doesn't seem to be terribly fond of me. All the same, he's paid by my husband to do anything we ask of him, though I shan't be staying much longer. Uncle Hyde Manor. Dearest Mama and Papa, something has gone terribly wrong. The Count de Uncle Hyde is not the man I thought he was. He has hurt me, abused me. I need your help, or I fear my own death will be upon us soon. I have nowhere to go and no friends to turn to in this foreign land. Mama, Papa, I miss you dearly and need your help more than ever this time. Please send for me. Come and retrieve your little girl before it's much too late. Respectfully, Madame Lottie of Dunkelheit and Lamberte, September 27th, 1858. Evening, 1117, September 29th, 1858. I found my letter in my husband's study. It never got sent, and something tells me it never will be. I am a prisoner in my own home now. I have no key to this mansion, and all the doors to the outside are constantly locked. I tried asking my husband about being able to go outside, have some fresh air, and go on a stroll. But he simply laughed in my face. He asked me if I truly felt like going out with such a hideous and battered looking face. He was the one who had done this to me. I even tried insisting that I only wanted to visit the guard in the backside of our estate. But it only ended with him kicking me out of the room and closing the doors. He says that on Saturday some guests will be coming for me to entertain. I knew he hadn't meant my harpsichord playing. I cannot stay. I have to get out of here. I must. Evening, 1157, October 2nd, 1858. Tonight was supposed to be the night I entertained for my husband's guest. But I used his preparations for the night as a chance to slip out. He was distracted, trying to make everything perfect. Perfect for what? I hadn't a clue, but I knew I shouldn't find out, nor should I want to. So I thought I could use it to my advantage. Surely at some point the doors would be unlocked, so those who I would be 
entertaining could come in, and I would wait for that moment. Was he going to be so neurotic and particular to unlock and lock as every person entered? I highly doubted that to be the case. He had a gown picked out for me, and by my stars, it was absolutely gorgeous. But I wasn't about to wear it. No. I told him that I would be in the boudoir, putting it on, but instead, I hid myself away in a pantry where I could spy the entrance. Even should I never see an opportunity, there was still a chance he would search for me when I never came down, and then I could make my way for it. I waited and watched. Sometimes, I held back my breath, fearing that somehow he already knew what I was doing and where I truly was. And then a chance showed itself. He began calling down for me, and while doing so, he was unlocking the front entrance. His temper was getting short when I hadn't responded, and so he had left his post and stomped his way up the stairs. I gave it five seconds before I made my escape and ran toward the door. I knew if I tried too soon, he would hear me and it would be all over. How easily I got outside. It all seemed too perfect, like the challenge had never existed in the first place. I hoisted up my petticoat and began sprinting my way toward London. Surely I could find the coppers and they could keep me in their custody until my family came for me. But only a few steps away from the door, I was greeted by the sound of howls and the barking of dogs. Fear welled up in my throat and behind my eyes when I turned to see five hounds making their way for me. I nearly tripped over my own feet in my startled state of mind, but I knew I couldn't stop now. I let my barely dressed feet stomp and slide their way through the unbearably damp mud and proceeded en route. The next noise I heard was probably even more mortifying than the previous. It was the sound of hooves galloping and the whipping of a crop, and based on what I knew, the rider sounded to be of my husband. I hardly doubted I could outrun the dogs, but now to outrun a horse as well? But faith and hope that I had given myself enough of a head start ushered me to move forward, and so I did once again. That was until I felt fangs digging into my lower calf, almost pulling me back to where I had escaped. I tried to kick the beast off of me, but its teeth had already dug itself far into my flesh and tissue. Another mutt had pounced me. This time, my arm was the target. I feared that these monsters would surely tear me in two, if not into shreds. The sound of the first horse drew close to me, and I noticed that I could hear galloping from other directions too. Was I about to be surrounded by men on horses? Suddenly, as I tried fighting off the hounds, I felt an incredibly forceful yanking at my hair that pulled me straight off the muddy ground I had been struggling on. The back of my ankles dragged behind me as I was heading the opposite direction I faced. Though, what I did face was my husband on a white horse my locks wrapped around his hand. A few times, my right leg got hit by the legs of the horse, and even more times had I bashed into my surroundings with every part of my body, and occasionally did I get whipped with a riding crop in my husband's hand, as he ever so violently took me for a ride. His destination was a place where he could meet up with his guests who were eagerly awaiting us. Some of them had rope and were readying it for me, but it wasn't for what I had assumed at first. My husband threw me out into the open, and I heard the hounds catch up and stop at his order in German with an improving tone of voice. At this point, there was too much for me to focus on since I was surrounded, and I had my eyes set on the man with rope, so all I could go off was a sound since he was behind me. The rope had been tied around one of my ankles on one end and then to the back of my husband's horse with the other. They began to shorten it so that my calf was raised just above the ground. Whenever I tried to break free or pull away from the men, I felt a lashing from a whip or a boot to my body, usually followed by laughter you'd often find from some party games. The men japed and poked, some claiming what a disappointment it was that they would not see me perform tonight. 
I was so dazed, the faces were blurry and hard to make out in the moonlight. The only one I could see for certain was my husband's and his sterling blonde hair. He was smiling at me, or at least smiling in my direction at the situation I had found myself in. For some reason, I don't know why, I heard myself cry out for him to help. Help me. Don't do this to me. Please let me go. Perhaps I could win his pity and he would ease my burden. He walked toward me and I thought maybe I wasn't a lunatic for the thoughts that just popped into my head. Oh, my Klein Lottie. He began to speak. Mine dooms a stare. Still thinking about yourself. He rubbed something onto my arms that was sickly sweet smelling. And then I suddenly felt the knotted rope around my ankle get tightened by his own doing, right before he remounted onto his horse. To say I was in for a bumpy ride was a major understatement. In fact, a joke made in extremely poor taste, but I thought I would try my hand at grave humor. I felt every rock and mound beneath my back and ass, cutting up my clothes and skin, tearing flesh around my legs and even my arms. Since only one leg was strung up, the other flopped around haphazardly, hardly able to keep it in one place. I tried not to let it hit the ground. For the speed we were moving, I feared it would get yanked back at the knee and surely break. I also was worried that the horse would trample my leg, and I really didn't want to experience that pain from this angle. The hounds chased along and nipped at what they could, making me realizing the point of that sweet smell rubbed on me moments before. In small glimpses, I was able to look back at London and how far away it truly was to me. If London some place only a few miles away from my residence had become so distant. Then what of France, my true home? What a fool to think I'd get there. I couldn't even get to the edge of my own estate. Back into the mansion, and I swear, what was left of my clothes were completely stained red from blood. Though, then again, there was probably more mud, or at least a good amount of it to make up where blood wasn't. I knew the fiasco that just occurred outside was only the beginning. But was it just the beginning for the rest of my nights to be spent here? Or was it the beginning for tonight was the real question. Because if tonight had only just begun with me nearly losing my limbs and then losing any hope I ever once had, then what more could possibly be in store for me. Perhaps putting me in that headspace where I ask those kind of questions was a form of torture on its own and was exactly what he wanted. I heard the men ask my husband what the plans were for me now, as I was in no condition to perform. I believed myself hardly able to stand, even with a rush of adrenaline. Honestly, for what reason would I have to stand, or walk, or run, or hide? Clearly, I was stuck, and moving around would keep me from healing any faster. The only reason I was inside and not out was because they continued to drag me by the rope around my ankle. How had the bloody thing not come off by now? Lottie. My husband began softly calling for my attention. Standing over my contorted body, rope still in his hand as though to imply he had a leash on me, and I must obey. I know you're conscious, mine austere. I didn't want to look at him or talk to him, but I felt as though he'd punish me for that. A punishment I knew I didn't deserve, but he would feel more than justified in giving. Look at me, Lottie. I know you can. I didn't want to obey and give him the satisfaction, but I knew that my pride would only make matters worse for myself. This creature I once thought could be my husband was not to be trifled with. I always knew we weren't equals, but I never thought like this. 
My breathing was heavy, and everything ached. I never knew that something as simple as changing my gaze could be so painful as well. Ah, there's a good girl, mine hostess. Very good. If I had the strength to glare, I would have fought the urge to do so. What a foolish girl you are. All we were going to ask of you was for you to perform, as you so do like to show off. But now, you hardly even have the strength to show emotions. I don't believe him. How could I after the other night? Besides, was he honestly trying to guilt me for having me pulverized? Did he really see these men as good people and me the rotten one? Rosa will help you to your room and help you to your bed. Katerina will be down here in your stead, since you are not fit for playing, and I promise all these good men a performance. I know she pales in comparison to your skill. But who's the one who remained adamant on not entertaining us, and now can't? Katerina, Rosa... I believe these are the names of some of the maids here. Such lovely red hair you have, mine hostess. You almost can't tell it's soaked in blood. And with that, he yanked the knot from off my ankle in a swift motion, which, whilst it did not hurt, made me jolt with the illusion that it would. My own movements made everything worse, and I almost writhed in my newfound pain that I had accidentally inflicted on myself. The maid, I assumed was Rosa, came to pick me up and carry me to my chambers, offering to start me a bath and whatever else she made up through her silent sniveling and sobbing. She laid me in the porcelain top and began scrubbing my ached body and the bath was stained with brown and red. I'm sure I must have shit and pissed myself in all that happened, and now here I was, being bathed like an infant after an accident. She meekly put me to my bed and laid me to rest after murmuring apologies to me in both English and another foreign language to me. <laughs> I used to find it funny that English was the language my husband and I had communicated with each other in, even though it was neither of our native tongues. What made things more peculiar was the fact that they seemed to be fluent in French and used to speak to me in that exclusively before marriage. I suppose I saw it only fair that we meet halfway, though he knew my preferred language. Now, English would just be a prison of hate and disgust for me. Another way he can taunt me. He better not dare use French to do this, and that is why I am content that he uses English. As I was laying in bed, thoughts began to crawl into my head. What if I hadn't tried to run away? Certainly. I wouldn't have been trampled by horses and lashed by whips and riding crops and then dragged by the teeth of bloodthirsty hounds all while wishing I hadn't hair to be strung by like some, uh, some hunted animal. Hunted animal? My lord, I was more on the spot than I realized. He saw me nothing but game. This was all on purpose. There was no way he went from upstairs to instantly on his horse in a few minutes I made my way out the door. He never went upstairs, and he never accidentally left the entrance unlocked. He knew what I was planning and allowed for it to happen, just for another form of hunt. A more traditional one, in fact. <sighs> from the sounds of it, I don't think Katarina will be making it through the night. Thank you for listening. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, reminding you that if you haven't already, don't forget to cast your vote for this contestant via either a thumbs up or a thumbs down vote. New entries will be posted throughout the month. Be sure to tune in and vote for each of them and help decide who becomes the next evil idol. Until next time, turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.